and welcome back everyone to another episode of Going Steady with me, Dr. Yonit Arthur. And I'm Pippa Bront. And we're both audiologists who specialize in chronic medically unexplained dizziness, tinnitus, and sensitivity to sound. We're so excited to welcome you back. We had some great comments about our last episode. We heard you enjoyed it, and you submitted some great questions that we're looking forward to answering today. But first, Pippa, we've had a hard week, haven't we? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a very tiring week, actually, um, yeah. with the ADP course. And yeah, my kids have had a tough week, which means that I have a tough week. Amen. As well. yeah. yeah. Amen to that. Yeah. Yeah. So for those who don't know what AEDP is, do you want to say us say a word about that? Because I mean, here's our here's our chance to talk about that. Um okay. And then I always like delay on the uh, use the acronym. I can't remember what it actually stands for. Accelerated, Accelerated experiential, experiential dynamics <laughs> therapy. Bit of a mouthful. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a really good relational emotion based therapy, which Diana Fosha developed. And I just love it because it just. It sits well with me. You can be who you are without having to take like a neutral stance. And I think it really helps people to get to the emotions that are underlying a lot of these symptoms, which is helpful. Yes. Yes. Because there's so much good evidence from the work of Dr. Schubiner and Dr. Lumley and others that emotional awareness and expression is, is a key factor and actually makes therapy for chronic conditions more effective than mm -hmm. just using cognitive means. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. my recovery involved a lot of journaling about emotions as well. And I don't think I would have got well without doing that, but it is different for different people, obviously. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that you've had a hard week, but I will say in the spirit of AEDP, it it does comfort me a little bit to know that my hard week and your hard week happened at the same time and that we're not alone in that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so for those who don't know, one of the one of the basic tenets of AADP is undoing aloneness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want to say a word about what that looks like? I think people just, AADP is one of those unsung heroes of, of therapy. I mean, it's one of these techniques that's just so beautiful to see and experience. And and I I want to I want to give you a chance now before we go into the questions to say a word about that. Like what makes it so so comforting and so nice as as someone who's receiving it. Um so it's partly that the other person kind of really feels it too. Like really genuinely feels it as well which is quite intense and there's something about the relational aspect of it and not being alone with the emotion and give having permission to have the emotion that makes it feel more pure almost and like it removes this layer of anxiety that often comes along with emotion because the emotion's there but we don't want it to be there and then fighting it off but it just asks the guilt to just leave for a bit and just feel the pure emotion which then makes it feel even if it's an emotion that you would typically think isn't a nice emotion like anger or sadness it just still feels right and true in that moment mm. which is such a change for people because I I get questions like this and none from this particular comment section but okay so I'm really upset I'm really angry now what do I do <laughs> right mm -hmm. so what you're saying is that when you're working with someone who's skilled in this particular type of method it doesn't have to be AEDP specifically but with AEDP as well you're 
the presence of another attuned person uh, it lets you open up and experience it in a way that is very hard to do on your own. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. It, it, is, it is really beautiful to see. I've, 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 I haven't done as much training as Pippa has in AADP, but we both did level one together. So I, I know enough to, to have seen how beautiful it is. Yeah. Yeah. So well, was a tough week. What happened for you? Oh, yeah. Uh, so my husband was gone all week. So it was me running the household, losing remotes of all kinds. <laughs> he was on, I was like, he was on his way back. I was like, he's going to come back and the house is in shambles and nothing works because I've lost everything. And I don't know how, how I did that. But you know, the house is a mess. And it was me doing all the driving back and forth and the after school activities and the cooking and the getting people up in the morning and the the whining in the morning is when someone didn't want to put shoes on or get dressed and then going through some other back end transitions with the work that I'm doing that's been really quite stressful and it's just been a, nothing nothing awful but you know Pippa it reminds me yesterday I was having some physical symptoms of anxiety which is not my norm anymore and mm -hmm. it made me realize you know I would if I were not aware of this work I would have looked back and been like there, nothing happened. Everything's fine. Like this was all like everything was going fine. There was no like no big deal. Like this isn't anxiety. I must be sick or something. But yeah. because of the work that we do, I recognized these small things do accumulate. And then the pressure that I put on myself internally when these outside things happen really, really puts pressure on me. And yeah. I think that's what was, again, just I didn't have to fix or solve that, but just recognizing that I think made that a little bit easier to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. And you planned a little bit before as well, didn't you? Because I remember you messaging me before your husband went away saying, yeah, I'm going to get takeout. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And we actually didn't even need to uh, because I stocked up at Costco before we went. So shout out to Costco. Um, but it was still you know, again, just small little things. And mm -hmm. I think the trap people fall into, and goodness knows I, I can do this as well, especially you and I, Pippa, working with people in these awful situations in their lives right now. We can all get into this trap of someone has it worse. I don't deserve to feel yeah. blank, right? Yeah. yeah. I don't yeah. deserve to to feel sad. I don't deserve to feel. And then there's all this, there's this extra layer of shame and guilt over what you're just feeling. You're just, I mean, I'm just feeling whatever it is that I'm feeling. I can't control yeah. what I'm feeling. Yeah. 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 And you know, the system just doesn't care that someone else has it worse. <laughs> right. 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 And this is why I have a, a bit of a, a contentious relationship with gratitude practices. Yeah. What do you, I see what you, you're saying. Right. Yeah. Like I love yeah. the idea of spending time practicing gratitude. I think that, that there's clear evidence that that does help mm -hmm. change your brain and the way that you look at the world. But I think it can toxic positivity can sometimes mm -hmm. be a just a step away from practicing gratitude. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So I do do gratitude, but I do it at the end of my journaling. Mm -hmm. So that I can get the rubbish out first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than going straight to it. Right, right. Well, that actually brings me to one of the questions that was asked by Ava. And this is probably, I, I'm, I, I'm jumping in on the hardest question that we were asked. So go us. Um, <laughs> so Ava, let's see if I can find her question can here. I just add as well though oh, that absolutely. your stresses were harder because you were alone in them you didn't have Philip's support and I think that's why they got to me the way that they did mm. this week yeah yeah and again I'm so grateful that I have the training and the structure in my life to make room for this and to have a tough week and for it to not impact me long term because I I I know I'm going to have to work with these things. Mm -hmm. If I didn't know, I mean, I, I can think of times in the past where 
I would go years feeling this way <laughs> and not even mm. realize how much it was impacting me. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. So it was the question about DNRS. I'm just trying to find it because I am to totally disorganized and did not find it. Okay. There it is. So Ava asked, she says that she was doing a neuroplasticity program and in the neuroplasticity program, she was taught basically to imagine herself the way she wanted to be, like create new, new beautiful pathways that the brain can then use rather than the old problematic pathways of neural circuit issues. Mm -hmm. So Ava says she's recently found this channel and she says that she started doing somatic tracking and some of the other things that I recommend and her symptoms have increased. Mm -hmm. And she was wondering, is that because she had basically been taught not to focus on symptoms and now focusing on them is causing them to increase. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on neuroplasticity programs like this that teach you how to think about positive things rather than focusing on symptoms or reacting differently to symptoms. It's a difficult balance to get right. I think really difficult balance to get right because we don't want to be like focusing on doom and gloom all day long. But at the same time, I think sometimes, like you're saying, the positivity can take you away from some of the emotions like anger and sadness and then contribute to the process in that way because we're kind of saying that the emotions of anger and sadness are dangerous. We have to avoid them with all these positive thoughts and then every time we have this little bit of anger coming up the brain treats it as dangerous pushes it away you know I can't feel that and then you've essentially got this danger <laughs> inside you triggering the high alert danger mode just because you've got a normal healthy emotion so there's that side of the positivity which is why I always do the gratitude at the end mm -hmm. after the other stuff That's I remember point trying picturing myself walking down the road when I was dizzy I remember lying there for hours <laughs> it felt like hours but it probably was just a few minutes each day for a little while picturing walking down the road feeling well but it didn't make me walk down the road feeling well <laughs> maybe yeah it didn't work um because the emotional stuff needed to be addressed first and I'm not exactly sure what therapy she's been using but I guess the other is potential issue is that I think you can only do somatic tracking when you're in the right frame of mind because if you're in the wrong frame of mind then somatic tracking is gonna increase the danger around the symptoms and so maybe it's better to go with whatever she was doing to help avoid it at certain times and then you do the tracking when you're in a good mood and can actually genuinely look at the sensations through a lens of safety. And for some people, maybe they need to do a bit of emotional work before somatic tracking and some people don't, or some people just need to only do it on, on certain days. Does that or make sense? Symptoms or with certain sensations, Potentially, right? Potentially, depending on how threatening they're feel, feeling, by those sensations, yeah. So the advice that I give people, and I actually I'll, pinning what you said about bad frame of mind versus good frame of mind, I wanna, I wanna hear more about that. But what I'll often fr uh, advise people to do is if they're not in the right frame of mind, if they don't have that the, the, the right intention, if they can't have the right intention because they're just so dysregulated, then maybe it's not a time to focus on your scariest symptom. Maybe mm -hmm. we want to track something much, much, much simpler. If you, mm -hmm. let's just say, because some of you guys I know like structure to your day and you're like, I'm going to do somatic tracking once or twice a day. Okay. And that's, I, again, I'm not a very structured person. So that makes me feel stressed out, but I understand some people really feel, find comfort in structure. So if you're having that kind of day and you feel super dysregulated about your symptoms, maybe instead of tracking a really scary sensation, you can track a neutral one. And there's usually at least one neutral place in your body. And it could be your pinky. It may not be anything related to dizziness on that particular day. 
Mm -hmm. And on your video, your latest video on somatic tracking, you talk about tracking emotions instead. You can do that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that. And, or you can even track your reactions to the symptoms being, mm -hmm. being really dysregulating and just, just stay with that, like the fear or the anxiety itself, which I know takes some skill, but coming back to this though. So what's, what would you call the right frame of mind and what's the wrong frame of mind then to do somatic tracking? That's a difficult thing to, to judge, I guess, but some days you just wake up feeling rubbish and everything feels worse in general and the day just feels more daunting and so on those kind of days when you if you try track a symptom and you you try observe it with mindful curiosity and interest which is the aim of somatic tracking you're just going to end up getting frustrated. I guess the way to tell is to notice your reaction when you're doing it. So if you're trying to track the symptom, but you notice you're getting really still quite, I want this to go away, and you just can't step out of that, you, you're not tracking it with mindful curiosity. You're not tracking it with curiosity and ease. You're tracking it through a lens of danger, which then feeds into the cycle of this is a dangerous symptom and then amplifies it like she's describing. So I don't know if some of that could have been going on on top of maybe, as she said, bringing attention to the symptom more as well, maybe. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And we what talked about thoughts? that. Yeah. It's like we, we talked about, she may have been responding to what we said in that last podcast about how sometimes when people start, they feel worse temporarily because they're they're giving they're like shining a spotlight on the thing that they've been avoiding. Mm -hmm. But typically, I expect that to be temporary because ultimately, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> this is th this you're gonna you, I know you know this metaphor so so well, Pippa. But it's like if you have a dark room. And then you set it, right? <laughs> you know this one. And you light a candle in the middle of the dark room. It's so obvious that you've lit a candle in the dark room, right? So it's kind of like, okay, we, we're now paying attention to symptoms and it's been dark all along. And oh my gosh, now there's the symptom, all the attention's on the symptom. But when we turn the light on in the room and then there's a candle in the room, or you just have time to get used to the dark and then you've had the candle on for a little while, you adjust and it doesn't seem as obvious anymore. So it's just a, it's to me, drawing attention to the symptoms initially can make things worse simply because you're just, you're shining a light on it. And that's temporary as your brain gets used to that. The reason I know that analogy is it's the typical audiology. Tinnitus. Tinnitus one, yeah. Yeah. I, I did kind of mix two of them in there. I kind of <laughs> used both, but hey, it's okay. Um, there are two different ones that I mixed together, but um, yeah. So, okay. Thank you. I think, I hope that helps Ava. And I think you, you're totally on the right track. Just don't be discouraged. Switching, switching methods like this, uh, can, again, when you're starting to focus on things that you've had a hard time with, can make symptoms worse temporarily. And it doesn't mean you're doing something wrong. But I, hope I remember also, actually, yeah. though, when I was doing my recovery, I remember thinking, actually, I remember reading, if it gets worse, when you start doing these techniques, that's actually a good sign. Because if it was a structural injury, it wouldn't get worse. Just by paying attention to it. Yeah. Psychological processes. So actually, it's good evidence that it's neural circuit. Oh, that's a great frame too. Thank you. Oh, and the same with journaling painful. as well. Like if that, if you start doing some journaling and actually the symptoms increase, it's really good evidence that there's something going on and that this will help in the long run. You know, that reminds me, I was working with a client the other day who has a lot of doubts about whether the symptoms are structural, which is another question that was asked. So we'll get to that one next. And it was so interesting uh, because as I was working with this person, her symptoms were wildly going up and down as we were like approaching emotional distress. Mm -hmm. 
And it was so, I mean, I was watching it thinking, how is she not noticing like how I ask a question and then boom, oh, wait, wait, I can't answer that. Sorry, my symptoms just got really bad. And then we, I'd regulate her, we'd come back down and then, oh, symptoms are gone. Okay, cool. And now we're, we're used to this question, but now I ask another question and then boom, symptoms come up. So uh, I think it's interesting to me that when people have doubts and are, are, feeling like, okay, this, this can't possibly be me. Is this really a stress related thing? They're not always the best judges of that. So, so you listener or watcher are, are not always the best judge of, of whether your symptoms are related to your stress because you're in your skin hundred percent of the time. It's very hard to be objective about what's going on. But when I talk to people, often I'll see patterns that they don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting when that happens, when you you hit on some kind of emotional issue and suddenly symptoms go through the roof and you're just like, oh, good. Yeah. Like, I was relieved for her. I was like, oh, because yeah. I because she had so many doubts. I was starting to have doubts. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe this isn't a neural circuit issue. Maybe there's something horribly wrong with her. But then as soon as I saw that happen, I said, no, this is this is good old neural circuit dizziness right here. That's what this is. Yeah. 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 It's really helpful when that happens in session. And it's it just is. so clear. So, so clear. So yeah. clear. Yeah. yeah. So that brings us to Laura's question. And Laura's really struggling because she said she knows I, I know what to do, but I can't do it because I just I'm still stuck on this idea that there's something medically wrong with me. Mm -hmm. Um, and she said, mine started seven years ago. No one was talking about PPD at the time. I always have this fear that it's my neck or my inner ear because she's hearing wind noise in one ear um, or when changing positions. So how how do we, how do we help someone who knows what to do and can't do it because they're too afraid it's medical? I guess what's the worst that could happen if it was medical and we went down this approach, if they've ticked all those boxes, first off, I'm so sorry she's been struggling for seven years. I just have to say that. But if she's ticked all those boxes, there's nothing left to do medically. Obviously, if there are boxes left to tick, then she should absolutely do that. So there's that side of it. And then she could look for evidence to kind of rule it in. Like we were just talking about the emotional triggers and obviously there are other things to rule in as well. But she could start doing, I mean, when I started doing this, when I started doing my journaling, I had a hell of a lot of doubts as well. I mean, everything I was reading was about back pain. I didn't even have, I didn't have back pain. And they'd have like the odd, like one little word dizziness in the whole book. Yeah. And sometimes the people have some dizziness. I know it's so yes. like passing reference. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a lot of doubts, but then I just started doing the stuff anyway. And for me, that started with learning more about it and the journaling. And then I noticed changes. And to start with, I couldn't believe the changes. But then you start to you start to see it once once the doors open a little bit. But I think it's okay to not be fully convinced to start with, and it you can still do it as long as you've ticked those medical boxes. There's nothing really to lose. And actually, when I did my pain reprocessing course, they said you can do it for cancer. It won't get rid of the cancer, but it might turn down the volume on the pain. So the worst that can happen is you turn down the volume. Right. What are your thoughts? Right. That's such, that's such, what do you have to lose? What do you have to lose? Well, some self-exploration and personal growth. I mean, that's, that's why I advocate for this. You know, I, I mentioned this in the, our, our coaching meeting the other day, but I've been contacted multiple times at this point by people who who create devices or supplements who, who want me to to hear um, or endorse the products and um, the reason I don't is because I think that 
for, well, first of all, I, of course, my integrity is is super important to, to me. I, I really want to be as unbiased as I possibly can. We all have biases. I just want to be as clear as I can. But the other reason is because right now I feel like the techniques that I'm I'm advocating for people. What what do they have to lose by taking them in, into consideration? I'm asking people to be, treat themselves with more kindness, to look at their emotions to maybe talk to people about how they're feeling. I mean, right. Or maybe journal, do some, like, you know, do some soul mm -hmm. searching. I, I, we're not telling mm -hmm. people to go have expensive, uh, go get expensive devices or go have really risky procedures. We're not doing that. So what do you have to lose is really a great way to think about this. And I want to add on to that, if I may, that mm -hmm. I think Laura here, she seems, I actually know Laura, so I know she's very smart. She's very, very bright. And often when I, with people who are really bright and really analytical, they know everything. They know more than I do. They could, they could teach me a class on what they're going through, but there's a barrier sometimes to implementation. Like there's mm -hmm. a, there's a, they really feel so stuck. They cannot move forward. And I'm wondering if you have any tips on on that if that if Laura's in that position or other people who are in this hyper analytical mode and are just stuck on the rumination and anxiety and just feel paralyzed, how do mm. you help people get unstuck? I think for some people they kind of need to hit from bottom to get the motivation. I know I did. Um yeah, and, and I know that I did and that it had to come to that because I just wouldn't believe it. I think the other thing to remember is that our brain is giving us symptoms to keep us, partly to keep us away from difficult emotions because they're difficult, because it's not an easy thing to address. And also we've been doing things a certain way, reacting to ourselves a certain way for a very long time. And so it's kind of scary to suddenly try learn a new way. So it's not easy from that point of view. But, I mean, it's worth it. But for me, I had to be really quite desperate yeah. to try it. I, I think that's what defines the situation for a lot of people here. They're like, never in a million years <laughs> would I have been doing what you are telling me to do. But I I really had no choice. No one else had any solutions that that made sense. I, I am people's last resort. They tell me this a lot. And I, I take that, I don't take that as as an insult. It's just, as you say, Pippa, it, it sometimes... Sometimes you do need to reach your absolute limits in mm. order to 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 be able to move past some of those barriers. Yeah, and yeah. that it is hard sometimes. I mean, like I told you before, I had a patient a little while ago who was really angry with me because I couldn't just give him a pill for dinner tests. I, I couldn't just. There you go. Job done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it takes more kind of energy and commitment than just putting something in your mouth every day but it's worth it because like you said you know what's the worst that can happen you have more compassion for yourself you end up feeling your feels feelings better and feel stronger and more comfortable in your own skin as a result yes and you know Pippa I want to say also for Laura to hear and for anyone else to hear. You, I, I, I spoke about this in one of the shorts I put out recently about how you're allowed to have doubts and everyone has doubts and that doesn't mean you can't get better. So stop beating yourself up for having doubts. Mm -hmm. But I've met people who've come through my course who don't have neural circuit dizziness, who have dizziness from a physical cause and they still get better. They still get better. Now, it's it's a little different when there is some kind of biological component, we have less 
I don't want to say control, but we have maybe have a little bit less influence over that than we'd like. When it's mm -hmm. just a neural circuit, we have a lot of influence. When if when it's biological tissue damage, we have some influence, but maybe not as much. And yet I've seen people, I, I one person in the coaching group recently uh, shared this story with us. And it, there's been just this huge transformative change, huge reduction in symptoms, huge difference in in this person's ability to live life. And yet there is physical tissue damage. And I'm not talking about a unilateral loss, which is one of those weird forms of tissue damage that I don't expect to cause chronic symptoms because the brain can compensate. This is someone who has something that typically is thought of as something that would cause long-term symptoms indef indefinitely. Wow. And yet she still got better. Yeah. That's yeah. So amazing. Good for Laura to hear that too. I, yeah. I see I see that yeah. enough to say, really, you really have nothing to lose. Yeah. And also the doubts themselves can be a distraction from the emotions as well, of course. That's that another good point. Loops. That's another good point. So, okay. So now, of course, I'm going to go after that bone that you just threw me. So <laughs> emotions, emotions. Uh, so, so, then, <laughs> so just could you tell me any thoughts on how we could advise people who think, hmm, maybe my doubts are covering up emotions. How could they get at what's going on underneath? Any thoughts? So they could think if I wasn't worrying about my dizziness now, right now, what would I be thinking about? What would I be doing? And just see if there's anything else or what else could be going on that's making me, I mean, it's like that book you recommend, isn't it? We get the feelings of anxiety in our body and then the thoughts come in to try work out the reason for those feelings of anxiety and sometimes the thoughts get it wrong and actually maybe there's something else that we're worrying about that we're not quite sure what it is mm -hmm. yes i i love the recommendation you just made and i want to say that if you heard that recommendation well, what else would I be thinking about if I didn't have all these doubts and these symptoms? I would be living an amazing life and everything would be great. And that's people's, that's usually people's first response. So yeah. let that out. Yeah, have, fair have enough. It. Yeah, 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 fair yeah. enough. Fair yeah. enough. Totally get that. Yes, absolutely get that. Right. But then when I let people say that piece first, often sudden, suddenly other surprising stuff comes up. And sometimes I'll ask them a direct question. And by the way, again, I mean this with complete compassion in a, in a, in a curious way. I don't ever think someone wants symptoms, but I'll say, and what, what scary things might happen? Like what unpleasant things might you be feeling if you weren't feeling doubts right now? Like what would you have to, to, to work with? And, Again, just in a curious way, just to kind of get their get their thoughts going in that direction. It can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to move on to the next question. Yes. So, um, yeah, we had some lovely notes, by the way, from Gary and from Toby. And I don't know who this person's name is, but it's Esperanta Polynice. Um, So that's the username. So hello. And... Um, Dustin likes our, our show too. I'm just shout outs to all of you guys. <laughs> ah, and this is a wonderful question. You ready for this one? We, mm -hmm. I know we chatted about it a little bit before we went on air. Miranda is asking about what she called a relapse. And I have expressed my, my opposition to the term relapse. I like to think of it as an extinction burst or as, um, a recurrence rather than a relapse because relapse implies that there's like, you're just constantly standing on like a pit that's going to suddenly collapse in every so often. Whereas recurrence means it's here again. And there may be a totally different story behind why the, the symptoms are here now. So anyway, sorry for nitpicking about words. I get really specific about words sometimes. Um, but Miranda says she spent about three months in 2022 discovering neural circuit dizziness and doing the work, got to 90% better, stayed there for a year. Then now I feel like I'm at square one. And so she's wondering, what do you do when you when this happens? And what do you do um, to help get, get yourself better? And she says, I know I can get it. I know I can get better because I've done it. 
but there's so much doubt and fear and defeat. And she says, mm -hmm. she feels like she's done all the work before. And that's, that's where I might focus my answer, but I'd love to hear what you think. I mean, first off, that's really, that sounds really, really hard. Cause she thought that she'd sorted it and then suddenly it comes back. A year seems a little bit long down the track for extinction bursts to me. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, depends on how we think about extinction bursts. Because um, Vanessa used that term in her interview after like ha not having symptoms for seven years. So, wow. so yeah. So I was like, oh, wow. that's not how I thought about that's using the word extinction burst. Yeah. yeah, I don't typically, you're right. Mm -hmm. I don't typically use it in that context, but I... I like that term a lot better than I like relapse. So um, if that resonates with people, they're welcome to use that term or recurrence is more of a neutral term that I prefer. Extinction bursts I think of as more of when the symptoms are on the way out and then the brain's just trying to say, no, it's not. Like with that, Alan Gordon talks about this in terms of the rats study, was it Skinner's rats? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where they'll press the where they press lever the lever more, more, more. to yeah. get the pellet, and then the machine stops working, and then you'd think that they would just give up and stop pressing it, or press it the same amount as when food came out. But then after a while, they really, really go for it, and they keep pressing it, keep pressing it before they give up and don't bother altogether. And so he talks about the brain doing that as like a last, last ditch attempt a last ditch resort yes yeah to get your attention and to make sure that we focus on this and that we continue with this way of doing it um rather than just letting it go and he says that you know if you can get through that bit without the fear and almost preps people that it's likely to happen then after that the symptoms will just go away but then relapse you would think more has something else happened in this person's life that has triggered it to get yeah you know, the symptoms to get stronger so it it's kind of opposites really isn't it yeah yeah and that, you know what I, I i agree with you i i think this probably doesn't fall into that category. When someone gets 90% better and then is living life, then that's not really an extinction burst. So touche. I I I take your I take your point and I think you're right. <laughs> well we, I I will call this instead a recurrence, not an extinction burst. So so you wonder if Miranda maybe had something going on in her life that might have prompted this. That would be my first question as well. Yes. Like what happened right before you had this big increase in symptoms. Yes. Um, and this is, I think, where things get tricky because external stress is, is only the tip of the iceberg. So what often will happen is people are like, I don't know, I just, you know, just everything was fine. And I just went to the store and, you know, I came home and then boom, like out of nowhere, it was crazy. Um, and first of all, I think back on my week and your week, Pippa, and I think mm. of like, an accumulation yeah yeah, yeah. Like this so this is why i love my stress bucket metaphor so much and i talk about it enough to make people crazy because i like little drops of stress over time are enough mm. to fill up the bucket right absolutely the other thing though is as i was saying like external stress is not the in is not really a good indicator of what's going on on the inside mm -hmm. and three months is also a relatively short time to get a really good sense of what's going on on the inside. So I wonder, I wonder if Miranda was one of those wonderful and fortunate people who were able to say, oh my gosh, there's nothing wrong with me. I'm going to get back out and treat myself a little better and live my life. Oh, I'm free mm -hmm. of this. And get that get these great results which is wonderful mm. and i encourage everyone to do that mm. but maybe because she got she got better so rapidly she didn't she wasn't really forced to take a look and see what else was going into my stress bucket what other internal stress might there have been that was underneath the surface of this external stress that i know about 
Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. I agree. And it's like, instead of having a symptom imperative, it's just got worse. Right. 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 Could you define that for people just because I don't think I've used that term, <laughs> symptom imperative. Um, what do you call it? Symptom carousel, don't you? Or something I, like that. I've come up with all sorts of names. Yeah. <laughs> uh, symptom drift, symptom carousel, whack-a-mole. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't use that term because it there's an implication. Say again, I, I get real stuck on specific words as you are noticing in this podcast, everyone and Pippa. Um, <laughs> but imperative is is like the implication of the word imperative is you're being forced like yeah. you're forced to have yeah. symptoms and yeah. i just ugh, I, yeah. I i don't think that 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 term quite describes the process i think it's no. more uh alarm is still happening in yeah. someone's it's body. a star no term that yes isn't it? yes yes it is yeah yeah but yeah. i think i think his implication is that they get the education that I mean he sees it as all anger but the emotions are affecting the symptom that awareness stops that particular symptom from happening but the anger hasn't been addressed and so it's imperative that another symptom comes in instead mm -hmm. to keep them away from the anger mm -hmm. because yes. the anger must be does that sound a bit weird? Control that. Yeah, you don't. No, no, that makes total sense. And translating that into kind of what we know with the modern neuroscience, if the alarm is still happening in the body, the symptom is going to still be there and yes. or it's going to come back. If, so I, I yeah, thank you for translating yeah. into modern neuroscience. Yeah. This stuff is dated. It's a little dated, but but he was mm -hmm. brilliant and like totally my intellectual grandfather and yours, right? I mean, like yes. we would not be doing what we were doing without his work. So no. um, yeah, I, I quote him every time I say goodbye to someone who's graduating from my work in whatever context it is. There's nothing wrong with you. Go live your life. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what he said. Apparently he said it very, he was pretty gruff too with people. He was very blunt with people. Um, but to me, this is something that I worry about sometimes for people who do get better very quickly. Mm -hmm. And Miranda, I'm I'm so sorry. It's it's not fair. And I I wish you weren't asking this question. I wish you weren't going through this. I but I do think it's a it's an indication to to me that there may still be some work to do on on how stress stress is affecting you. And what I mean by stress is I don't mean, oh, well, now you have to live your life free of stress so that you don't ever have symptoms. That's that's not what I mean at all. It means to me that the way your brain is processing stress is maybe not where you want it to be. And to me, if I were to translate that into more kind of emotional terms, it, it would be something like external stress may be having a strong effect on you on the inside. And so you may be ramping up into this alarmed state as the result of relatively tame external stressors. And that's something that is flexible. It, it's something you can work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add there for Miranda? I mean, she may know what it is. It may be an obvious stress. Of it course. makes, yeah, yeah. It may, it might be quite clear when, if if she thinks about it, or it might not. Yeah. And like you say, it could be a an inside stuff, or it could be a combination of outside stuff combined with her internal reaction to that. Sure, sure. All right. So I think we have time for one more. You want to take one okay. more? Okay. So, okay. So we have a, a few unnamed users saying hello and, and loving our, our podcast. And we have a hello from Jill and from Karen and Paula and Kimberly and um, EVA Productions, Suzanne, 
Okay. Yes. And so this last question is from Malcolm, who's asking, I've had PPPD for over 10 years now, and it has been at a baseline for many years, but about a year ago, it went up to an eight and above. It's horrible all day. Is this normal to just happen after so many years? Um, I mean, I guess that's very similar to the question before in a lot of ways in terms of something probably happened, mm -hmm. either cumulative or obvious to make it ramp up. So how would you suggest if Malcolm wants to, to figure this out, how would you suggest he, he start doing that work? I mean, he could potentially write a list of potential things that could be contributing to it and then look at the list and see what shouts out. Or, I mean, you know, I'm biased towards journaling because it helped me so Which much. Is so good because I don't talk enough about journaling. So this is one reason it's so important for us to do this because we both like different tools. So okay. please, yes, please talk about how he could do that via journaling. So then, yeah, so then... If you write about the items on the list, if you get the wrong one to start with, and you write, I feel angry about this, and you think, I can't feel it. Then after, you you know when you hit on the right one that is particularly contributing. But then of course, there's all the stuff for him because it's all been going on for a long time and he's not made the recovery that the other person had. And so like you were saying before, there's probably stuff about the way that he's relating to himself, putting a lot of pressure on himself, and maybe criticizing himself, wanting to do the best job at everything, all those things could be contributing as well. Um, yeah. And like the whole lot for him really, I guess. So now the million dollar question, say he does figure it out, like, oh, I know what it is. It was this event and I'm kind of uh, hard on myself and I don't relate to myself securely. Uh, what does he do? Like, I guess really it my question on is- him though, doesn't it? It does. But how, but how does people like become kinder to themselves through journaling? That's a burning question for me. So you can write about personality traits is one way of doing it. So you could write about how you learned to do the perfect job at everything and how this has helped me in this, this, this situation. However, I now realize that in this, this, and this situation, it actually isn't helping me. Mm -hmm. And actually it'd be better if I could recognize when this trait's helping and when it's actually hurtful, and maybe if I could just let go of it and have a bit more self-compassion in the situations where it's hurtful. But I think as well, writing about the emotions, if we're going, if we're sticking with the writing stuff, <laughs> can automatically lead to that once you've expressed the full emotions and written about all the thing, ways it's made you angry. At the end of that, you can get a better perspective on everything, which allows you to then be kinder to yourself somehow in I was time. just thinking that. So maybe I have an optimistic view of human nature, but we're designed to relate. Like we're designed to connect. And when you write down your story and you realize just how much you've been suffering – most people will start to feel compassion for themselves. They'll mm -hmm. say, wow, actually, I didn't realize like this has been super hard. Mm -hmm. This I have been really tough on myself. And if they're able to, again, this is assuming they're able to ask the guilt and shaming stuff to step back. Um, but yeah, I can see how that, that might work. Yeah. 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 Well, this was another lovely chat and I hope that 
all of you learned a lot and we would love any questions that you have for our next episode, drop them below. We're again going to stick to this kind of format where we're answering and responding to your questions and comments. So we would love again to, to know what you're interested in having us talk about. And again, also just so valuable to have both of us talk together because again, we do have different perspectives sometimes and that's really helpful. So thank you, Pepper. Can I just add, sorry, yeah. on that last one as well. I think a common nervous system in general just leads to more self-compassion in general so oh. as well. Yeah. Anything that they can do that they enjoy that helps them relax, like, like meditation or just, just generally bit, the common nervous system will yeah. also automatically lead to more self-compassion as well. It reminds me of that interview I did with Tanner about polyvagal theory, how being in a ventral vagal state naturally, like there are tr there are qualities that come along with it. You don't just end up calm. You you tend to end up calm and connected as well. Yes. So so it, it kind of, that state change kind of brings with it some of these other qualities you're talking about. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you often see that really dramatically in ADP, and I'm sure you do with your IFS as well, where yeah. someone's fully express their emotions and then at the end they feel calm and relaxed and then they view the situation differently and they have so much more self-compassion totally totally which is a, such a different approach than that top down like i must learn how to be self-compassionate uh, which is a skill worth learning for people especially those who don't resonate with this idea of feeling emotions um, but it seems to be a more powerful and organic experience when someone's able to get there from this kind of more bottom up approach. Like I went through this emotion or I went through this memory or this experience. And now that I've brought it to completion, my nervous system naturally goes into this healing state, really. I mean, like yes. a state of calm that, that allows self-compassion to emerge rather than needing to force self-compassion down your throat, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, that's a really, I'm glad you added that on. Thank you. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you, everyone. So again, questions and comments below. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe. Follow the podcast. We will talk to you guys soon. Thank you so much for tuning in. Bye, everyone. Bye.